Mr. Vice President, welcome to Seattle. I want to thank uh, everyone who is here this morning uh, for this event, uh, for taking the time to be here. Your presence uh, says a lot about the importance of this issue that we're talking about today and about Seattle's commitment to make a difference, uh, but not only for our city, uh, but for the world. A year ago, on February 16, 2005, uh, I launched the United States Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement. And I did that because the issue of uh, climate disruption, of global warming, is one that we've known about for a long time. But it's one that I think many of us treated as being far away or long into the future, not something we needed to worry about. And uh, as uh, I've uh, experienced uh, this last uh, winter a year ago and met every week with uh, Superintendent of City Light, uh, Jorge Carrasco, and uh, the head of Seattle Public Utilities, Chuck Clark, and we talked about the fact that we had a record low snowfall and the kinds of uh, things we were going to need to ask the people of Seattle to do in order to conserve water because we did not have that snow uh, melting in the Cascades, uh, it became clear that global warming is not something far in the future, it's not something far away, it's something that is here, it's now, and we have a responsibility to take action. And so on that day, I asked the people of Seattle to work with me to take local action to meet the reductions called for in the Kyoto Protocol. On that day, it went into effect in 141 countries as law, but not the United States of America. And as an American, I'm embarrassed by that. The, um, the fact is that I wasn't sure we could get 141 cities to join with us, one for each country, but I asked the staff at the Office of uh, Sustainability and Environment and my staff to try and meet that, that goal to have mayors from around the country to join with Seattle in taking that kind of local action. And I'm proud to report that as of this morning, uh, with the signing uh, of the U.S. Climate Protection Agreement by the mayor of Lawrence, Kansas, we now have 219 mayors across America. In the last week, we've added Omaha, Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, Des Moines, Iowa, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Charlottesville, Virginia, and yes, even Arlington, Texas. <laughs> These are not particularly blue cities. These are cities who, like Seattle, are concerned about the future of the climate for our children and our grandchildren. It cuts across politics, it cuts across geography, it cuts across philosophy. And I am so proud of the people of Seattle who have uh, provided leadership on these issues year after year. You can think back to the fact that 100 years ago we had the first municipally owned uh, electric utility plant at the Cedar, uh, hydroelectric. And last year Seattle City Light became the first major electric utility in America to have zero net greenhouse gas emissions. We, uh, we called the events that we had yesterday in the city a climate of change uh, because it is going to take change on the part of each and every one of us if we're going to avoid the catastrophic effects of global warming. And uh, we had some very, very powerful presentations in our city yesterday. About 500 people uh, came uh, to Benaroya Hall to listen to former Vice President Al Gore uh, give a presentation he's given hundreds of times across the country about what we can expect to happen, what we know is happening. We had about 300 people at town hall later in the evening to listen to Elizabeth Colbert, who authored a, a magnificent three-part series in The New Yorker about climate change and who shared both the scientific and, and stories that she had learned in her travels from Greenland to Alaska to the Antarctic in uh, observing and reporting on this, uh, this uh, event. Um, so here we are today having gotten those very, very sober presentations yesterday 
And Seattle has an opportunity to make a huge difference uh, for this country and indeed for the world. Today, my Green Ribbon Commission, 18 of our most respected community leaders are going to present their recommendations for Seattle to meet and exceed the Kyoto Protocol reductions. Today is about choosing the future that we want. It's not going to be easy, but on the same uh, token, it is not impossible. It can be done. It will require us to act together and to change some habits, some very old habits that we have. But in one sense, we are lucky. We still have a choice. And it is an issue that uh, I think Vice President Gore is going to tell you uh, in a few minutes that can bring us together as a city, as a state, and as a nation around a common purpose. And that purpose is the survival of our species. We can choose to change today and begin moving in the right direction, or we can choose to do nothing and to face the consequences of a changing climate for ourselves, for our children, and for their children. Today, Seattle chooses the first path, and we begin down that path toward a solution to this challenge. Most of the commissioners are here today from the Green Ribbon Commission, and the report is going to be presented by Commissioners Dennis Hayes, who is co-chair of the commission, Tom Crowninshield, and Yolanda Sinde. Uh, Dennis, thank you for your leadership in, in uh, co-chairing the committee. I know a year ago when we called you together, I promised you'd be a six-week task. Um, I knew better. I knew better. And so did you. Uh, but you said yes, and I am so proud and so grateful to you and your fellow commissioners for the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Nichols, for your leadership and for that splendid introduction. And yes, we all thought it would be more than six weeks. Some of us suspected more than six months. Frankly, this has been a long but enormously productive kind of partnership, I think, for all of us. My, my co-chair, Oren Smith, intended to be here. He's the former CEO of Starbucks and played an integral role in putting all of this together. He went to Southern California for eye surgery. Uh, the, the good news is the surgery went well and he's healing, but not quite as rapidly as possible. And his doctor told him that he could not climb into a plane and have the change in air pressure or drive over mountain passes with the change in air pressure. And given the cost to him of attendance, I think we can all forgive him for not being here. I had an email from him this morning expressing his regret and expressing his uh, strong enthusiasm for everything that the commission is, is presenting. What we are presenting is a big, complex document that is simplified in a number of pieces of paper that are available to all of you here today. But to the extent that you'd like to dig into any of it in more detail, there's a website, uh, www.seattle.gov backslash climate. Seattle gov backslash climate. And it will get you into the appendices and give you ways to contact members of the staff and consultants and commissioners if you've got questions about any part of this, of this huge document. In conveying it to the mayor, I'm, I'm not going to go through the elements of it in part because relatively few of you are here this morning to hear me. Um, <laughs> But rather, assuming that in something like this, we will be very lucky if you can take away one or two things, I want to make basically two points. The first takeaway point, somewhat in contradiction to the, the, some of the coverage that was received this morning in the paper, is that while this is just a first step in a long, enormous journey, it's an incredibly important first step. The mayor referred to as 219 cities those mayors were elected by 44 million citizens. If those 219 cities were clustered together as one nation, the population of that nation would be larger than the population of 90% of the nations that ratified the Kyoto Protocol. And this is a big deal. Second, those 44 million people are Americans, which means they produce a vastly disproportionate amount of carbon dioxide. If you look at this group of cities successfully implementing the Kyoto Protocol, it has the same effect as the United Kingdom, that's England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, plus Holland, plus all of Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. That's the impact of what we're launching here this morning. 
The second point has to do with something that the mayor referred to. It's the extraordinary record over a very long period of time of Seattle's city light, moving to be super energy efficient and now to be carbon neutral. Um, the good news is that that's a wonderful leadership model for the country. The bad news is that to get 7% of a small number in the energy business is a whole lot harder than getting 7% of a big number. And if you happen to have a coal-powered utility and you can get people to change their lights and change their appliances, most Americans have a far less passionate love affair with their refrigerator than with their automobile. <laughs> we, we're going to continue to get them to trade out their refrigerators because, uh, among other things, it's a moral virtue. But, but, <laughs> but because it also saves energy and that electricity is then available elsewhere. But what we have to do to get Kyoto credits, the way that we do the accounting here in Seattle, is to be first out of the block addressing the toughest of the issues. We cannot get there without addressing the automobile. In a national context, Americans last year drove 60% more miles than the Germans, French, British, Japanese, Canadians, Mexicans, and Swedes combined. Just as a thought exercise, if everyone in the world drove as much last year as the average American, the total would be more than 51 trillion miles. Since the mean distance from the Earth to the Moon is 240,000 miles, that's equal to driving 213 million trips to the Moon. <laughs> Every year. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. This is one part of the American dream that is not replicable for the rest of the world, and frankly, it's not sustainable here. Not only do we drive a lot, but we drive incredibly inefficient vehicles that are powered by fuels that are rapidly running out and are increasingly centralized in parts of the world that we would rather not ship barges of money to. Uh, this report is addressing all of those things, trying to reduce the number of miles traveled, trying to make the vehicles far more efficient, and trying to shift increasingly to increased reliance upon biofuels, which is a renewable resource with which this region is increasingly well blessed. When you think of the inefficiency of the typical American vehicle, coupled with all of that mileage that we're driving, you suddenly find the explanation for why 4.5% of the world's population last year consumed 43% of the world's gasoline. Let me just ram that fact one more time. 4.5% of the people, 43% of all the gasoline in the planet. How sustainable a ratio does that sound like to you? How many wars are we going to have to fight to maintain it? And how can we ask the rest of the world to put their shoulder to the wheel on climate unless we address this most egregious example of our own gluttony? So these are the two things that I would very much like you to take away from today. This is an incredibly important step forward, and we've had the guts to step out and do something bold with regard to the automobile. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mayor Nichols, former Vice President Gore, my fellow commissioners, our favorite guests of Seattle here today. It's been an honor for me to take part in this Green Ribbon Commission as an industrial representative. When the mayor asked me to be a part of it, I didn't know public speaking was a part of it. <laughs> However, to think about 200 years of human impact on our environment is a daunting thing to be asked to come up and help with solutions. How do you do that? Well, it started here in Seattle, and as one city's effort, under the guidance and vision of our mayor, it has grown and blossomed into an inner, or into a national uh, community of cities that are taking part in the effort. And mayor, I believe that's up over 200, as you said, and congratulations for that effort, absolutely. You hear a lot, though, about working outside the box. Many of you are business people. Well, the Green Ribbon Commission, we took a look at that box. And what we found was four corners. And those corners kind of looked like sources, strategies, solutions, and stewardship. When you read our paper, you will find that the Green Ribbon Commission came up with some strategies for solution. 
But one thing you'll also find inside that paper is just a chart, simple chart, of what the major pollutions are in the city of Seattle. And that brings us to the real issue, and that's the one of stewardship. This belongs to each of us and every one of us individually. Because if you look carefully at the major contributors to poor air quality in this city, they represent things that every one of us, you and I both do. Lafarge, where I'm plant manager, we understand stewardship. And we are happy to be a part and a founding member of the Seattle Climate Partnership that the mayor has put together. We're going to go forward and we're going to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions for every ton of cement produced at our facility. We do this in various ways. Some of the ways are through alternate fuels. Some of the ways are uh, the slag modified cements that we've introduced to this region. But what does that really mean? Alternate fuels help reserve natural resources. It also keeps material out of the landfills and de decomposing into greenhouse gases. But slag modified cements are easier to produce because it takes less energy. And that means less greenhouse gases per ton of cement produced. But what's really important, all of this is good for our future, our future, because it's contributing to a cleaner environment in our city. We need to protect the special place we call the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, which is our home. But probably more importantly, it helps protect this globe, this earth that we all call home. So I want to thank you again, Mayor, for the opportunity in this groundbreaking event. And I look forward to many years of participation from all of you, as well as us at Lafarge, in going forward. Thank you. I want to thank the mayor and all the commissioners for the opportunity to represent community voices on the commission. Um, it's real important to understand that anything we do for climate protection helps us achieve environmental justice for all people, not only locally but globally, because whatever we do here affects everybody around the world. We are gobbling up the world's resources at an alarming rate, and we have a responsibility as Americans who are using up those resources to come up with solutions. I'm very excited to continue working with the mayor to take the plan from paper to action. And I'm committed to doing that in low-income communities and communities of color in Seattle until we see that this plan is realized. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, Tom, Yolanda. Let me ask the members of the Green Ribbon Commission, most of whom are here today, to stand up and let's recognize their efforts. I want to tell you that I have had a chance, I've been briefed on uh, your recommendations. Of course, none of us have seen them before this moment uh, at all. But I like the direction uh, that you have laid out, the blueprint that you've given, and the task that we have is to take that blueprint and turn it into three-dimensional action, and we're going to do that. We're, uh, I'd like to highlight one of the Commission's recommendations that we're already uh, moving ahead on, and that is something that Tom referred to, creating the a Seattle um, Climate Partnership. We've got uh, a concept here of a voluntary pact among Seattle area employers to reduce their own emissions and to help us meet this community-wide goal of reducing our overall emissions by 7 percent from the 1990 levels. The target is for uh, at least 50 of our top employers to join the partnership by the end of 2007. To, uh, as of uh, right now, six institutions have agreed to join with us. Uh, those are the University of Washington, the Port of Seattle, Starbucks, REI, Lafarge, and Urban Visions. And I want to thank them for being willing to step forward as a founding members of the Seattle Climate Partnership. <laughs> The 
by working together, by creating these kind of partnerships and sharing ideas, uh, experience, and expertise, we can achieve these goals more effectively and more quickly. I want to recognize some special folks uh, who are in the audience and joining us today, and I don't have a list in front of me, so this is a, a great peril that I am, uh, I am doing this. I mentioned earlier that Seattle has uh, had this uh, as part of its value system for a century. Uh, and that is uh, true for uh, not only Seattle City Light, but the city as a whole. And that means the council and the mayor. And the council is represented today by Council Member Richard Conlon. Thank you, sir. When we first uh, made this challenge, we reached out to s some select mayors uh, uh, around the country and locally and asked them to be the initial inviters to the uh, U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement, and one of those initial signers was our neighbor, uh, Redmond Mayor Rosemary Ives. Rosemary, thank you. <laughs> We've had uh, great support and leadership uh, these last couple of sessions in particular. The legislature, not, not in the short session, but the long session a year ago, passed a landmark uh, clean car legislation to have Washington State and uh, as it turns out, Oregon as well join in the California clean air uh, requirements. We uh, had gre uh, green building legislation passed. Those are landmark pieces of legislation, and we have a number of legislators here today. State Senator Eric Paulson, uh, Representative, <laughs> Representative Zach Hudgens, <laughs> State Senator Pat Thibodeau, and State Senator Adam Klein. Thank you for being with us today. This effort locally uh, and the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement has gotten the attention and uh, ima captured imaginations across the country. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce and ask to uh, speak for a moment Carl Pope, who's the Executive Director of the Sierra Club of America, which is our oldest The Sarah Club, as we well know here in Seattle, is the oldest, the largest, and most influential grassroots environmental organization in our country. Last year, the Sierra Club made climate protection a priority. They've embraced the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement, and through their Co Cool Cities campaign, they're recruiting new mayors to join. And I suspect in that list I gave you a few minutes ago that the Sierra Club's fingerprints could probably be found in organizing efforts in a few of those cities. Thank you very much. It's really a thrill to be here. It's a thrill to be here. I want to begin, Mayor Nichols, by thanking you for leading. I want to thank your Green Ribbon Commission for leading. Mayor Chavez, I want to thank you for leading. I want to thank the members of the Washington Legislature who passed the legislation that the mayor referred to for leading. I want to thank the two senators from your state and the congressional delegation from this metropolitan area, several of whose members are here today, for standing up for leadership in Washington, D.C., a place that doesn't yet get the concept. <laughs> Vice President Gore, I want to thank you for beginning the leading years and years ago. All right, let's have another round for the Vice President. It is a time for leadership, and I want to say here that I am confident that America will lead. You are not alone here in Seattle. As Dennis Hayes pointed out, what you're launching here this morning is something large, something big, something on a global scale huge. But it's not big enough yet. We have, as of this morning, 219 cities who have committed to join Kyoto. 
the Sierra Club School Cities Program, which was launched when I believe there were 212. I don't want to be dealing here with a rolling average. Committed that we would double the number of cities that embrace this goal. And when we do that, we will have 85 million Americans living in cities that have agreed to take the first steps towards a brighter climate future by reaching the Kyoto goals. But I want to underscore one thing. This endeavor is not big enough because it doesn't yet include enough Americans. And I'm confident that getting our goal of doubling the number of cities is not going to be that difficult. Americans are eager to join in a solution to a smarter energy future, to a brighter climatic future. But what will be a challenge is the second part of the bigger. Kyoto, my friends, is not big enough. We need a bigger dream. We need a higher bar. We need more challenging goals. We need a more ambitious vision. And the challenge I am going to leave you here with today, and those of you who spent the last year getting to this point may not welcome this challenge, but I'm sure the residents of Seattle will is, now that you've done this, I'm going to offer you the challenge, be the first city in America that figures out how to go beyond to an energy future we really need, an energy future where we are no longer dependent on fossil fuels to get ourselves to work, to heat our homes, to light our offices, to run our trios and our blackberries. Seattle, lead again. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. It's, uh, we're very pleased that you joined us today. Thank you. And thank you for your great support through the Cool Cities campaign. Uh, mayors across the country are taking this challenge up. Uh, and each city is doing it in a different way. Each city has a different circumstance that they're facing. They're experiencing climate change in different ways. For us, a year ago, it was the loss of a ski season. It was a record low snowpack. It was the recognition that the snowpack we rely on for water and for power has been reduced by 50% since 1950. And that brought it home for us. Uh, one of the early cities to sign on to the agreement was Albuquerque, New Mexico. Three weeks ago, the mayor of Albuquerque, Marty Chavez, asked me to join him and Mayor Rocky Anderson from Salt Lake City, uh, Governor uh, Bill Richardson, Senator Pete DiBenici, and Jeff Bingaman in talking to a group of 300 Albuquerquean residents about how they would put a plan together for that city. That summit, which lasted two days, has helped them to shape a plan much like the one that we are pursuing a goal of reducing their emissions by 7% or more from 1990 levels. And I am very pleased that Mayor Chavez is here today to join with us. Uh, it is a great city that he represents. It is a high desert city. It's very different than uh, Seattle, Washington in the damp northwest. They have different challenges. They're going to step up and together we and the other mayors across America are going to provide the leadership necessary for the United States to be part of the solution and not simply part of the problem. Join me in a great Seattle welcome for Mayor Marty Chavez. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. We just experienced the driest winter in recorded history uh, in New Mexico. So it seemed like a good idea to come to Seattle for a couple of days. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and you haven't disappointed me, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, John Kennedy said things don't just happen, people make them happen. Uh, and it is so, so true. Uh, and, and I can't tell you enough uh, the gratitude that America's mayors have for Greg Nichols and the leadership he played on a national level. in great part because of his initiative, we now have our blueprint for success in the city of Albuquerque, and that's being replayed all around the nation. Uh, I didn't come up here to criticize the current federal administration. Don't have time for it. Uh, came, time, came up here to act. 
But I will confess, uh, Mr. Vice President, over dinner last night, the uh, mayor and I talked about how nice it would be if we actually had a federal administration that would partner with us to do these, the right thing. <laughs> Albuquerque today is 65 percent compliant. Carl, I recognize that's a starting point, not the finish point, and we have so much more to do. Two weeks ago, I issued an executive order and said, City of Albuquerque is not buying any more non-alternative fuel vehicles. No five-year transition periods, two-year trans uh, uh, periods in between. We're just not doing it anymore. The technology is there. It's time to move. Uh, and I came here as well. <laughs> because, Mr. Mayor, I understand that one size doesn't fit all, but it overlaps. Uh, and there's much we can learn from each other. And so I want to thank you again for your leadership. Uh, Mr. Vice President, um, as you know, we don't win every single battle. But because of your vision and your leadership, we're going to win this war. Thank you very much, Seattle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Congressman Adam Smith uh, from our area is known in Washington, D.C. as someone who puts his vote where his mouth is. He earned a 100 percent rating by the League of Conservation Voters for his work to ensure funding for the Energy Star program and tax credits for renewable energy. The U.S. administration may not be there, but uh, our members of Congress are, and I want to ask Congressman Smith to tell us about the efforts in the United States House of Representatives. Congressman. Well, first of all, I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank Vice President Al Gore for his leadership on global warming. He has been a singular voice on this for years. And really what we're seeing is the, the offshoot of that, what comes when you stand up and show that kind of leadership and drive home a point that gets the public's attention and starts to cause people to act. Um, you are seeing things throughout this country that are starting to move in a positive direction. And towards that end, I certainly want to thank Mayor Nichols and all of the cities um, who have joined in this effort uh, to this point uh, for their efforts as well. And be sure and recognize in the 9th Congressional District, uh, we have four. That gives us about, uh, I think, 28 others to work on. Um, but Auburn, Burien, uh, Tacoma, and Renton have all signed up for this program. And I would you know, pledge my effort to try to get everybody to sign up and work on this as well. Um, there are also, you know, there's, we can clap for that. There are other positive things happening. I prime sponsored a green buildings bill um, back in Congress to try to encourage um, folks to uh, build green buildings, to give the tax credits and to give the incentives necessary to help push them further in that direction. I'm pleased to be here today with Congressman Jay Inslee, uh, also from our state, who has taken a huge leadership role in this issue in his new Apollo project piece of legislation to get us to embrace alternative fuels far more quickly than we currently are. Um, it is also leading on an initiative that I am proud to support in this state um, that will do that as well. There is a lot of positive things happening. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of rare, actually, that you can trace something like this so clearly back to one person um, who has talked about an issue and made it um, such a national priority. So I really do appreciate the Vice President's efforts on that. There was a whole lot we can say about this. But I'm going to be brief and just make one point. I think this is an incredibly exciting issue for a lot of different reasons. But the biggest one is we can do this. Um, you look at the challenges out there, and they can appear daunting. But the possibilities and the opportunities, the more I talk to people, the more I meet with people, we have the technology. We have the ability to get this done. And let me tell you, as a member of Congress, that isn't always the way it works. Um, there's a fair number of problems that come across my desk that are either A, simply not possible to solve, or B, require brutal, brutal choices um, to try to make at least tiny incremental progress. That is not the case with changing how we consume energy in this world. We have the technology. We have the ability. All we need is the will and the leadership and the commitment, and we can really change the world on this issue. And I want to thank all the people here today who are doing that and pledge to you that I'm going to do my best to try to get more on board so that we can show that will and show that commitment to make these positive changes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Congressman Smith. 
Congressman Smith mentioned that we're also joined by uh, Congressman Jay Inslee from the 1st Congressional District uh, here in Washington State. Uh, Congressman Inslee is, and don't ever get this wrong, because I did once, uh, is a graduate from Seattle's Ingram High School. Uh, and when he was there, he was known as sort of an elbow, elbows out basketball player. Uh, he went on to the University of Washington and he tackles climate change and environmental issues with his elbows out. And I'm very happy that that's the case. He has been a strong and passionate advocate for us in the nation's capital. And he is articulate in talking about the need for our nation to step forward on these issues. It's my pleasure to introduce Congressman Jay Inslee. Well, it is a great honor to be on the stage with a fellow elbow thrower, Al Gore, who I may note, if you ever get down about this issue, recollect that America has already given their majority votes to a leader for president who believes in doing something about global warming. That's happened already one time. It happened again. It happened again. Well, my, my father was the first basketball coach at Self High School. I learned a lot about Chief Seattle or Chief Self. And today is a great day in the spirit of Chief Self. Because Chief Self, he understood that we do not own the planet. We are one fabric in the cedar Indian basket in the planet Earth. And this really is a great Chief Seattle day in that regard. And I want to tell you the people in this room, led by Greg Nichols, who's doing a great job, and the people of Seattle are optimists with a capital O. This debate is one between the optimists and the pessimists. And those who believe in the Green Ribbon mission are the optimists. If British Petroleum could reach its Kyoto targets in four years, we sure can in Seattle, in America. When Brazil can run 40% of their cars and trucks on biofuels, we sure can in Seattle, in America. We are the optimists who are going to make this happen. I want to give you three reasons to feel optimistic this morning. Reason number one. Uh, yes, the ice is melting in the Arctic, but the ice is melting in Washington, D.C. We are picking up people. I had two members the other day, two conservative Democrats come in, came up to me the other day after hearing Al Gore speak to them and said, we give up. You win. We got to do something about this. Okay, so the ice is melting in Washington, D.C. Second reason, this Spirit, this message is currently available to you in Washington, D.C. Some of us believe that we've got to tackle with the same bold vision of John F. Kennedy. You said we're going to the moon for 10 years. We think we should have the same vision on this issue. And the new Apollo Energy Project I've sponsored is going to come to pass. And Dennis, I can tell you, your spirit's alive in Washington, D.C. in the new Apollo Energy Project. And I hope you're going to help me pass it, too. And we need a little help in that regard. Second. Second. Reason for optimism. You can become involved today <laughs> by signing Initiative 937, which is the state's contribution to this, which will create a clean, renewable future in electricity, saying we're going to have 15% of electricity by 2020. It can be clean, renewable. Pass Initiative 937. We could use your help. Third thing I want to say. Third thing you can do to help this effort it's really interesting. I kind of noticed, Greg, due to your great leadership, we have 219 cities on this now. That's interesting because to pass the new Apollo Energy Project, you need 218 votes. We have 219 cities. This November, send a message in America. You better get off the tracks if you're a politician, if you stand in the way of progress on global warming. We've got to send that message this November. We can do this in this state. So I hope you help me in that regard as well. Last, I want to just, just close with this comment. Our nation has been slow to this effort. And it has not been consistent with our, our destiny or our history as a country. We have been slow for a variety of reasons. One of which, unfortunately, we mentioned the Arlington mayor here that used to be run by a, the, or the Arlington, Texas Rangers by a general manager who traded Sammy Sosa, <laughs> who went on to not be a spectacular leader on this issue. So we have been a little slow and not consistent with our tradition. But I am convinced that Seattle is going to lead America on global warming. 
And America is going to fulfill its destiny to lead the world on global warming. We are the optimists who created software at Microsoft, who led to the world with the first commercial jetliner in Boeing. If you believe in this, you are an optimist who believes in innovation. You believe in the Seattle message. We are going to lead the world, and we are going to restore America's rightful place as a leader on this moral imperative to save the planet in this planetary emergency. Thank you very much. Last, but not least, it is my uh, great honor to introduce to you someone who has talked and acted and brought the nation's attention to this issue for uh, the last decade and a half, uh, starting, uh, well, actually starting before he wrote the book on the subject, Earth in the Balance, uh, Vice President, former Senator, former member of the House of Representatives, uh, Al Gore is a passionate believer in the future of this planet, the, our species, and our ability to affect the future if we take action today. Please join me in welcoming to the stage here in Seattle, former Vice President Al Gore. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Put your pen back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction and to all of those who have spoken. I agreed with everything I heard. Uh, to those in the back, thank you for the leading the standing ovation. I'm uh, really <laughs> appreciative. Um, it's great to be back in Seattle and to be with so many good friends here. Uh, and my purpose is really uh, very simple. I'm here to applaud and publicly recognize an act of extraordinary leadership by this city, by the people of this city, who have lifted up a leader as your mayor who in turn mobilized and lifted up the leadership from mayors all across the United States and in the process has made it possible for you here in Seattle to lead the United States on this great moral challenge. It won't be easy. These recommendations are going to be difficult. And yes, they're just a beginning. But What's happening today is the beginning of a true sea change in the way our country actually responds to the moral challenge represented by this climate crisis. So, so my first point is simply uh, to say thank you. And I wish I could I wish I had the eloquence to share with you the feelings that I have had in traveling all over the world and giving uh, presentations on global warming and then encountering people in Europe and Asia and Latin America, Africa, uh, the Pacific nations, everywhere. They say, yes, w w we see this and it's going to be hard, but we have to respond. But, they ask, sometimes they can't find the words because they don't want to hurt an American's feelings. But here's what the question has been from people all over the world. What's happened to the United States of America? Why, as our world faces such an extraordinary, unprecedented challenge, why is the natural leader of the world, the nation that has for so long symbolized and given breath and life to the greatest hopes of men and women everywhere who know that we are intended to be free and govern ourselves and reach our potential and make decisions 
to safeguard a future for generations to come. They look to us in the United States of America and they wonder what, what's, what's happened. And it's up to all of us to continue our efforts to provide a meaningful answer to that question. But here's my point. It, it helps me so much to be able to say, yeah, okay, um, the federal government of the United States of America has really messed up on this. But let me tell you about Seattle and 219 cities and leaders at the grassroots level who are standing up and providing the leadership that is needed. Margaret Mead, uh, as many of you know, once said, uh, never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, that's the only way the world has ever changed. When Rosa Parks refused to get up, uh, it, you could say it wasn't enough, but it was enough to start a mass movement that awakened a moral conscience in a nation that had been asleep. This, as others have said, is really not a political issue. It masquerades as a political issue. It's disguised as a partisan conflict. It's really not. It is a moral challenge, an ethical challenge. It is a spiritual challenge because it runs to the very essence of who we are as human beings. We represent an incredibly complex collection of potentials both for good and for bad. But at moments when history has challenged us, we have often found the ability to respond by transcending those limitations and reaching out for, as Lincoln said, the better angels of our nature. At the time of America's greatest challenge, President Lincoln said, we must disenthrall ourselves and then we will save our country. And now in this time, we must disenthrall ourselves from the habits, the illusions, the comforting reassurances that we don't have to change. And hear what Greg Nichols and these leaders are saying. There's an old African proverb that goes like this, when you pray, move your feet. <laughs> Many of us have prayed for the sea change that we've referred to here on this planetary emergency. But Greg Nichols is showing us how one city, in moving its feet and mobilizing action, bringing together men and women who have put in countless hours in working out very difficult details, embodying the business community and all parts of the greater Seattle community. I have been watching this movement since it began, and a couple times I've been uh, called in to uh, like a traveling minstrel. Uh, he collected, uh, he and Marty Chavez, a longtime friend, and and other mayors, they collected a bunch of likely recruits down in, uh, at Sundance so, and got them in a room and said, okay, now give them your slideshow. <laughs> and then they waited at the door saying, okay, we'll sign you up, we'll sign you up. <laughs> and uh, there have been <laughs> quite a few, many other recruitment events that I haven't been involved in, but I've watched it with, with great pride. Carl Pope, um, another great leader, said that Kyoto is, is not enough. I want to address that. How do we change in America? How do we balance the art of the possible with the need to expand the limits of what 
is possible. This is a challenge to our moral imagination. And the hard truth is that as of this moment, the maximum legislation or change in law or programmatic change that you can possibly imagine is something that falls short of what eventually will be needed. That's not to say that what eventually is done is going to be impossibly difficult and painful. Not at all. Most of what needs to be done represents changes that we should be making for other reasons anyway. It's not necessary for us to take 3,000 pounds of metal with us everywhere we go. <laughs> and And the fact that many people sit in traffic jams for two hours a day uh, is another sign that this is an unsustainable pattern. The fact, as Dennis Hayes said, that we've had wars at least in part motivated by the need to continue gaining access to that hugely disproportionate share of fossil fuels, another sign that the pattern has to change. And, and This planetary emergency, and it is a planetary emergency, is actually the second one we've had in 20 years. The first one didn't get as much notice, but we were ripping apart the stratospheric ozone layer. Some people's eyes glaze over when they hear that phrase, but it was happening. And it still is, but to a much lesser degree. And they said it would be impossible to phase out the chemicals that were causing that planet-wide uh, catastrophe. But the United States of America, under a Republican president and a Democratic Congress at that time, took the, took the lead in coming up with a treaty to start solving the problem, the Montreal Protocol. Here's the reason I'm bringing it up. It was not enough. And if you looked objectively at what full compliance with that treaty would accomplish, it, would, it was not going to solve the problem. But here's what happened. It represented the maximum that was politically imaginable, right at the outer boundary. But then when people shifted their center of gravity and started doing those things necessary to comply with that first step, they discovered that it was a lot easier than they thought it was going to be, and it opened up new opportunities that they didn't know existed. One business, Northern Telecom, they had a big facility in Nashville. They were based in Canada and had a sense of pride that the first treaty was there. And the CEO said, we're going to be the first in our industry to completely get rid of these CFCs, these chemicals that are causing the problem. And his engineering staff said, well, that sounds great, but we have no idea how we're going to do that. He said, I don't care. We're going to do it. We're going to find a way. And they started asking questions that they had never asked before. Everybody was focused on, OK, what new chemical compounds can we put together that would substitute for these ones that are causing the difficulty? We're using these chemicals to clean circuit boards. Then, under pressure, felt by the moral imperative, caused by the moral imperative, they, they said, wait a minute, how do, how do this, those circuit boards get dirty in the first place? OK, let's go back and redesign that process. They did. They got a patent on it. All their competitors had to pay them a licensing fee. The new process was cheaper, higher quality, better, faster in every respect. They beat their deadline by three years and led the industry. Then the world, inspired by similar success stories in the business community in sector after sector, said we can do more. And less than three years after the, that first treaty in Montreal, Margaret Thatcher hosted an international gathering at which the so-called London Amendments were adopted raising the bar, making it harder 
But the business community and all of the rest of us were by then ready to expand the limits of what we were possible, well, of what we believed was possible. By setting this bar for Seattle and the other cities that are committing to clear this bar, you are beginning to ask questions that you didn't ask before. And you're finding answers that make it really clear that this is an opportunity to do a lot of good things. Last night I, I said in the gathering of uh, business and political and civic leaders, you know, I've gone around the country and around the world in meetings with leaders to try to change minds one at a time, and I'm glad we got a couple of those uh, congressmen who said they gave up. <laughs> uh, I gave it to a group headed by Grover Norquist in uh, downtown Washington. One person there stood up and said, I agree with you. And then afterwards, several others came up and said, I agree with you. This is the way change happens. Get the politics out of it if you can and give people a chance to, to look really at that moral imperative. So uh, we, we now have an opportunity. And as I said last night in that gathering of leaders, there's a cliche about the Chinese expression for crisis. Some of you know this. It's made up of two symbols. The first symbol in isolation means danger. The second symbol in isolation means opportunity. There is a richness of meaning in their compound expression for crisis. Sometimes we hear crisis and go, oh, what are we going to do? And there has been appropriately a lot of emphasis on the danger that we face. Because until it's recognized and understood and internalized, we are not able to face it down and move through it to seize the opportunity. But trust me, as we do, we will find an extraordinary set of opportunities. And I am not just talking about the opportunity to build new products and make more money. Those are good goals, and that will happen. I'm talking about an opportunity that is far more valuable because this challenge will give us an opportunity to experience what few generations have the privilege of feeling during their time on this planet. This is an opportunity for all of us to share a common moral purpose and to rise to meet that moral challenge and in doing so put aside many more of the differences, the, the pettiness, uh, the bickering that we're all vulnerable to as human beings, but instead to focus together on a challenge that is worthy of our greatest efforts. As we rise to meet this challenge, we will find an opportunity for vision and moral clarity that may well give us the ability to see other challenges now disguised as political problems and reveal their true essence as moral imperatives with practical solutions. 20,000 people die every day on this planet from easily preventable diseases. Many 747s worth of people crashing every day. If we could see with a clear vision the ability to prevent that challenge. There are many opportunities. Let me give you an example of why. The generation of my father and many of your parents rose to meet the challenge of fascism and won a war in the Atlantic and the Pacific simultaneously. And for all the difficulty and suffering, the feeling they had in doing something that was so great and worthy, gave them the ability to see more clearly the other opportunities, the Marshall Plan, NATO, the United Nations, the Foundation for Peace and Prosperity that we've coasted on for 50 years and more. 
Omar Bradley said in that era immediately at the conclusion of World War II, it's time we steered by the stars and not by the lights of each passing ship. And they rose and they came back home and took on the challenge of segregation. And around the world, peoples threw off the yoke of colonialism. And with all of the difficulty, they seized a new vision of what we could become. This challenge. And each of us is going to need to change the way we live our lives in order to face this challenge. I'm old enough to remember President Kennedy standing up and challenging our country to, within the decade, put a man on the moon. And that energized our country to step up, and we accomplished that. I remember the feeling I had on September 11, 2001, when our country was under attack. And the days following that, when I talked to uh, my fellow citizens, and how we felt as Americans, and how the rest of the world gathered around us, if you will, in a giant global group hug, telling us that we, uh, they cared about what had happened to us and they were with us. Capture that feeling for a little bit. Capture that sense of possibility for just a little bit and recognize that in Seattle we have an opportunity to make a difference for this world between now and 2012. Kyoto is a small start and it is imperfect. There's no question about that, but it is the first time in the history of human existence that we have come together around a catastrophe, recognized it other than war, and said we're going to take action and our country is not at that table. In Seattle, and in 218 other cities, we are saying, no, we are at that table in spirit. And with the greenhouse uh, gas plan, with the uh, Greed Ribbon Commission plan, we are going to be at that table uh, physically as well. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for the support you're going to give me as we take these difficult <laughs> steps and as we make a difference for the future of our children and our grandchildren. God bless our home, Seattle.